Gospel of Mark. Turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, the eighth chapter. Beginning at verse 27. The Lord took me to somewhere that was familiar. And by the power of God, he gave me some things. And I was just writing these notes and I didn't know where they went. And he says, no, I'm going to surround what I told you with something familiar. And it reads, now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road, he asked his disciples, saying to them, who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others say the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And peace, Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that he should not tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after, third, after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. This morning's title is The Cost of Our Christian Confession. Lord, I thank you for your word, for your word is blessed. Your word is true. And I thank you for the honor and privilege to teach your word this morning in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. There is a cost to our Christian confession because a lot of people don't even understand that there is a Christian confession that we should live by. Confessions in courtrooms regard you telling something that you've seen, something that you heard, or something that you know. Sometimes confessions in courtrooms lead you to spill in your guts, but our Christian confession is our covenant acknowledgement. Our Christian confession is our consent agreement with the Lord Jesus. I said a consensual agreement with the Lord Jesus that comes from our mouth. We are of the house of Christ. Those who are Christians belong to the household of Christ. So there has to be some responsibilities to be from the household of Christ. Salvation is free. It is the free pardon of our sins. Grace is unmerited favor. We didn't ask for it. We didn't deserve it. And on many instances, we didn't even pray about it. God is love and his love is unconditional. But God says from my people, there's a cost that they must pay. And that cost is in their confession. Their cost is in their covenant agreement with me. That cost is in that consensual agreement that they make with me personally. That's why he is my personal Lord and Savior. I can read these gospels and I can talk to you about him, but, but he's there with me in my personal times when, when I'm in pain, when my heart is broken, when I'm afraid, when I, there's something going on that my life is in turmoil. He is there with me personally. I consent for him to get in the middle of my mess. I consent for him to come into the middle of my brokenness. I consent for him. I expose my sin. I expose my mess. I expose all that I have to him because I give him my consent. 
to do whatever his will says needs to be done. And this is my agreement with him. People walking around and say, well, somebody told me all I had to do was say a few words. No, there's something that has to come from your heart. You know, when I teach on finding freedom and experiencing the best things of God and experiencing God's grace and God's giving and all that God has attached to our lives, I speak from revelation and I speak from personal experiences. But I'm telling you, preachers who are in here and preachers everywhere and the Christians everywhere, we have to be very careful that we don't mess around and turn the word of God into something that's one dimensional. If we're not careful, what we teach and what we say to people will be all about getting something. I said, it'll be all about getting something. And we're so desperate today that we're not trusting God that the power of Jesus that saved me from my sin will save them from their sin. That what God did in his own way to find me and draw me back will draw them back. But we're constantly, it's almost like some type of spiritual clickbait. Prosperity, healing, joy, peace, love. All of those are wonderful things, but, but there is a responsibility. There is a cost of being a Christian. Like I said, we are the household of Christ. When we were raised in a house growing up, there were responsibilities about being attached to that house. I don't know how they do it today. But it wasn't just the house that I lived in. It was my whole family. You re represent all of us. I remember thinking that I was grown one time being down at the old Clarks. Some of y'all don't even know what that is. But I was down there, I think I was about 14 or 15, and I thought I was cool and sneaking and had a cigarette hung out the side of my mouth with my boys. We walking through Clark's, because one of my friends was old enough to get driver life. So we didn't have to ride our bicycles. Dangerous stages for young boys when they come off the bicycles and somebody start driving. But I had that cigarette and all of a sudden, Flame and ashes started coming up in my face and in my eyes. And there was an aunt that I hadn't seen in months and months. She didn't say, hey, Keith. <laughs> she just slapped cigarette, slapped me all at the same time. This aunt on my father's side of the family said, how do you think your mama would feel about you? She didn't even say, what do you think your father would feel? We came from something where somebody said, you got to represent. And if we're not careful out here today, we want to draw people into church. We want to draw people to God, but we're making it all about getting. And we're putting out there a little small sweet milk babies. Sweet milk Christians can't pull somebody back from the gates of hell. Sweet milk babies don't enter into spiritual combat with demons. Listen, sweet milk babies can't even tell themselves to say no to the things of the world because they think that I can get the things of God and still act like I want to in the world. I can come off IG, TikTok, and all of these other things, go club and do whatever and ever, and God is still going to give me whatever I ask for because the people in the church said all I got to do is ask and God will give it to me. There's a cost, and we're not teaching the cost. See, sometimes when I preach like this, people say, man, I'm going to tell you what, that, I, I, I listened to you, and that, that was a hard word. It's not hard. This is the word that will empower you. This is the word that pulls down strongholds. This is the word where you don't have to sit around and keep on worrying about cubs and them. You can go get them. You'll be empowered. I got tired of sitting at home and wringing my hand when I was first saved and wondering about things. God says, get up from here. Get up from here. I said, well, what you want me to do? I, I said, I can't do what you want me to do. He said, yes, you can. And you will do what I want you to do. 
and I took a vacation and went out of town and I had the worst time. Had this wonderful suite in this luxurious hotel and couldn't enjoy it because God then told me what I had to do and I tried to pull a, a, a Jonah and think I could go to vacation and forget all about it. There is a work that we have to do. And once we begin to do that work, we'll begin to be empowered. And once we begin to be empowered, see, this is the thing that we don't understand. That some of the things that, that, that you're asking for, God has to see that he can trust you with it. He has to see that he can trust you with it. That you're not wanting to get just for the sake of getting but you're getting because you need it in your arsenal to do whatever it is you need to do. Oh, my God. My God. Fewer and fewer are willing to commit to the cost of the church. They're unwilling to commit to the cost. Because anything that somebody asks a lot of people to do today without a promise of gratification is an automatic no. And I'm not talking about young people. I think we beat young people down enough. A lot of what young people do is what they've seen older people do. Somebody say amen. Amen. It's easy for us to jump on a generation and declare that generation lazy or declare that generation unsaved or declare that generation. We talked about it on yesterday. The importance is pouring something in them because the Bible says it didn't say that they wouldn't leave home. He says, but if you if you put them, raise them in the way, in the way that that, that they they shall not soon depart. They're going to go out there. But that prodigal knows that I can go to my father's house when I come to myself. They know that there is a father in heaven, but we have to put something in them and quit complaining about them. Because we don't understand. I'm not saying that past generations were any more holy or righteous than we are. I'm not saying that past generations were, were, were more committed uh, to Jesus than we are. But I do know from my being born in the 50s that those people were committed to a different type of life than we live in. I was talking to Minister Dillard, I don't know if it was weeks ago, but it, I thought about it yesterday. That thing that we call soul food would kill us today. Because in prior generations, they had to have that for the energy. They got up early. They worked all day, the men and the women. And what we call soul food, they they created, poor people, black and white, they created diets out of stuff that nobody else wanted. They created something that was good by how they flavored it and seasoned it, but they walked everywhere. They worked with their bodies. They didn't mind sweating. They came home and then they still went to work. When I was growing up, everybody had gardens. Everybody raised something. Everybody did something after they got off work. And they were committed. These were people who had seen world wars. These are people who had gone through the depression. These were people, some of that stuff even poured off on me because I'd ask my mama why you do certain things. She says, I'm a child of the depression. I didn't come through it, but I'm a child of the depression. These people had a commitment that they had to go through in life in order to survive. So that when they latched on to Jesus, see, they didn't have what we have today, but when they latched on to Jesus, they held on to it because they knew that that was a lifeline that could keep them going that could keep them flowing, amen? There was a commitment because they understood it. Jim Crow, that's all right. I got a commitment to Jesus that's bigger than Jim Crow. I got a commitment to Jesus than bigger than the government red lines that they're drawing around us. I got a commitment to Jesus that's, that's bigger than this law of segregation. I got a commitment to Jesus that says that I shall be free from the shackles of what you're trying to still hold me down in. There was a commitment by these people and for these people, amen? See, it's hard for us to commit to anything that doesn't give us gratification after 20, 30 minutes, anything longer than that. I don't know what it is when I hear these people, supposedly smart people saying that the intention span of adults today, especially young adults, are short. I'm sorry, I don't buy that. The attention spans are short because we haven't gotten interested in anything. I'm scrolling. I'm scrolling and I'm swiping. I'm scrolling and I'm swiping. I'm not mad at that. But if they would have started turning a page, 
If you start them out young, learning to turn a page, they'll learn to use their imagination. They'll learn to use their mind. They'll learn to be creative within their mind. And imagination keeps you interested in something other than what you see visually with your eye. And God has given every man and every woman and every child an imagination attached to his imagination. And it was in his imagination that he made the sky blue and the grass green. When you see the sunrise in the morning that came from the imagination of God, he says, oh, that's beautiful. And I think they'll love it. Come on, somebody. He's given that to us. But we have to learn to commit to something that goes beyond momentary gratification. Christianity in America is not a popular thing. The church, not the devil. The church in America has allowed itself to become political. The church, not the devil, has opened itself up to allow people to interpret the Bible. I didn't say translations. We need to get back to the Greek and Hebrew translations to gain understanding. I'm not talking about translations. I'm talking about interpretations where people actually tear pages out and says, oh, that's not really what it means. That's what it means because it doesn't suit their purpose. It doesn't suit their purpose. It doesn't suit their argument for the moment. This word is supposed to come down and cut me like a two-edged sword. It cuts down to the bone and the marrow because God is saying, I'm looking with this word. I can look at the motives of your heart. I don't care what comes out of your mouth, preacher. I can look at the motives of your heart. When you read this word, I'm not even talking about me preaching this word. I'm talking about sitting up in my house by myself. I can read this word and how that word attaches itself to me. God can look at my heart and see the motives, whether I am in agreement with him or I am in denial of his truth. We got to get to that place. You can't have no Christian uh, confession if you're going to use the word to interpret it however you feel at the moment. But today I want us to understand that no matter what this world is doing, each of us individually, somebody say each of us. Each of us can be light. Say, be light. be light. With a loud voice, say, be light. Be, light. be an ambassador. Be light. Live love. Be live truth. Live radical. For Christ Jesus. That's how we make a change. That's how we make a change. Not to debate somebody's interpretation. I can live this truth, I can live this love, and I don't have to bring my Bible with me so you can see the love of Jesus. We can make a difference. A few weeks ago, I was talking about cutting off the pipeline to hell. Well, if Christians don't get it together and get their confession together, and become willing to pay a cost of some kind, whether that cost is praising, I said sacrificial praising. I don't feel like praising, but I'm going to praise him because he's worthy. I'm going to praise him even if my back hurt. I'm going to praise him if I'm sad. I'm going to praise him if I ain't got no money. I'm not waiting on the blessing to praise him. I bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. I haven't felt like praising him all week long, but when I... Something other than what makes us feel good in the moment. There is a cost. Tell your neighbor, there's a cost. It's not always about feeling good. It's not always about feeling good. Scripture I read in Mark 8, they're in the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I chose Mark, and I'm going to go to Luke for something else because I like Mark's wording. But I want to show something to you before Peter's confession. It's preceded by, in this same chapter, pointing out, each of the Gospels point out that Jesus miraculously fed thousands and thousands and thousands of people. But when he spoke to his disciples, they missed the message. 
They miss the message. Jesus gives us the same thing that he gave the disciples. Subtle messages, warnings that we don't heed. We don't need a big booming voice from heaven. We just need to pay attention to what he's saying and not get stuck up and hung up on the miracle that we had seen. See, Jesus is exposing them to something. He's saying, what y'all don't understand is there's a subtle move that'll become a devilish place in your heart if you're not careful. I said a devilish place in your heart if you're not careful. In Mark 14, his disciples had forgotten, 8 and 14, they had forgotten to take bread. And they didn't have but one loaf. And he says, listen, Jesus says, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisee and the leaven of Herod. Beware. Beware. Leaven is yeast. Anybody that's ever used yeast and understands what I'm talking about. Once you first put that yeast in, you have to feed it with something, whether warm water or sugar or something, but you have to feed it. But once you put that yeast in, you don't see it. But after a while, things begin to swell up. After a while, things begin to expand. Jesus is saying, listen, listen, you got to pay attention. See, y'all missed it. He says, y'all are back here thinking about what took place with the bread. Y'all saw me sit here and have a back and forth with the Pharisees. Y'all saw us go back and forth. Y'all saw this disagreement between us. They coming to me talking about, well, you gonna give us a sign? You gonna give us a sign? We need to be careful of that today when people are talking about a sign and if, if, if Jesus do this and if God do this. Well, I'm sorry. God doesn't operate in cheap ma magic tricks. Go to Vegas for your cheap magic tricks. God doesn't deal with optical illusions and all of these things that fascinate people. Because this is a God that can take your life on the spot and condemn your soul to hell. So you need to get serious about who he is. And the danger is those of us who are supposed to know that still play around with it. The disciples missed it. They missed what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying that, that, that these Pharisees and Herod they have devilish motives and, and they spread it amongst the people. And while you're amongst the people, if you're not careful, you'll become a part of the whole load. That's where we are in the church today. I'm seeing faces in empty chairs that are out there. They become a part of the loaf. Hey, now, they become a part of the loaf. They're not a part of who God is. They're not their own separate piece of unleavened bread. They're not their own separate piece of, that God has made and shaped and, 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 and molded into what he has purpose for them in life. Amen? Because they say, oh, man, it's just because we didn't have no bread. You're thinking on natural terms. You're thinking on natural terms. Jesus says, come on, y'all don't get it. Y'all are not understanding me because you're not paying attention. We have to take our thinking beyond our natural self. Listen, each of us in this room have the ability to raise our thought process to meet Jesus where he is through the power of the Holy Spirit that's within us. We all do. Anybody at home, anybody that sees this later on. We have the ability to raise our intellectual minds to try to meet Jesus where his mind is, where his thoughts are. And if you start by asking the spirit of God to be with you as you read the Bible, this word will not just be logos, it will become rhema in your life. I get excited over the years, over the years, my God, these last 25, 30 years when I hear people talking about how they were reading the Bible and all of a sudden the pages just jumped off. I mean, the words on the page just jumped off at them and things became life and they felt something that they had never felt. And they've read that scripture before and they've seen something that they've never seen before because now they're looking at a word, but they're seeing something in their mind's eye. They're looking at a scripture, but they're seeing something in their mind's eye. Somebody say amen. 
We got to move our minds up to meet Jesus where he is instead of being fixed and focused on bread. So what did Jesus do? He said, you don't, you, you can't perceive or understand. <laughs> but he says, let me show you what he said. He said, it's not a head thing. Your heart is still hardened. This is something that we don't want to admit to ourselves. The softer my heart gets, the more I can understand the Lord. The more I'm determined to understand it my way, there's always going to be that little gate or whatever you want to call it. As long as I, my heart is hardening and I'm not willing to submit my thoughts to him, that's hardening your heart against him. And we think it's just uh, us having our own personal choices. Let me clear that up one more time. You were bought with a price. Christ died for you while you were yet a sinner. God demonstrates his love for every sinner because he didn't wait for them to come to Jesus. Jesus died for us beforehand. So now that I am bought with a price and the Bible says that I am not my own, I don't have this will now where I can step up and say, well, I got a choice and I'm a free will preacher. I am not free of anything except for the hold that Satan had on me. It is his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is his will. If my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ could say out of his mouth that your will be done and not my own, who am I to declare that my will on some level is important when it comes against the will of God? Jesus said, it's not an understanding thing. We harden our hearts because we are so a part of the loaf. Jesus said, boys, come on. Don't you remember? I broke five loaves for 5,000. How many baskets? Well, he said, I broke seven for the 4,000. How many baskets full of fragments did you take up? Seven. What is it that you don't understand? What is it that we don't understand? Jesus is warning us to be careful how we expand to what we feel that we need to accept in order to expand. Because it don't take nothing but a little doubt. It don't take nothing but, but a pinch of a rumor. Come on, you can take a little pinch of lie and a little pinch of rumor and you can tell a church all the pieces. You will have faith walking believers doubting with a little pinch of lie because there was nobody that was willing to put out the fire when the fire got started. Come on somebody. Jesus says now for the expansion that has to take place, you have to look at who the fight is really with. Y'all trying to fight with me about bread. I'm telling you that there is an enemy. I'm telling you about the Pharisees. I'm telling you about Herod. I'm telling you about people who are not interested in any more knowledge than the knowledge that they have already because the knowledge they have means money for them. They're not interested in what I teach. They're not interested in what I bring. Herod is only interested in holding Jews down so that the Romans will be kind to him and protect him. He says, I'm telling you about your enemies and you're looking at me like I'm your enemy and I'm trying to teach you something. We look at God like he's our enemy. And he didn't even uh, come to them to chastise them. He's just saying, listen, you need to pay, pay attention to the little bits that you're around. It don't take but a little bit of gossip to create a whole lot of strife. A little bit of gossip create a whole lot of strife. And the Bible says where there is strife, there is evil or every other evil word. Every, every other evil word. We got to be careful of what we want to add to the loaf. It's not us just being a part of the loaf. It's what we pulling in to the loaf. Because it don't take but a little bit. It don't take but a little bit. Oh, my God. My God. Jesus, after talking to them about this, he goes in Mark 22, before we get to the confession of Peter, 
in Mark 22. There is something that takes place that we overlook. We talk about the confession of the blind man seeing, the miracle, but the confession is the blind man walking with Jesus without seeing. I'm in this place. See, I'm not going to teach what we already know. I'm going to teach what the Lord gave me. You're in this place, and I'm calling on Jesus to know now when Jesus shows up, I got to come out of this place that I'm in and walk with him without ever getting the promise. It would be easy if I could have got the promise and then I walk with him. He didn't even tell me that I would get the promise if I'd walk with him. He just grabbed me and started leading. How easily are you led by Jesus? How easily are you led by Jesus? Do you fight him when he's trying to lead you out of place that you're calling him to? He's trying to lead you out of a place that you called him to. You called him to the place. He's leading you out of the place. You want him to bless you in the place. And he says, I got to get you out of the place so the blessing will take hold in your life. <sighs> See, Jesus says, Bethsaida is a mess. And he says, I went to a mess to get a man that couldn't offer me anything. To let you know that I'll come to wherever you are. Not about what you can offer me. But you got to be willing to walk with me when I say walk. You got to be willing to walk with me when I say walk. God is honorable. God is not going to drag you. God is not going to drag you. He'll let your hand go. And you'll say, the God didn't bless me and I prayed for it. No, he wanted you to walk out of that place. He wasn't going to bless you in that place. And Luke, let me tell you about Bethsaida. In Luke 10. We're tied together 10 and 13. He says, woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre, some people pronounce it Tyre, uh, and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it would be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than you. Bethsaida, you are a mess. You are a cesspool of sin. But let me tell you what the gospel of John teaches me. That Andrew and Peter and Philip were all from Bethsaida. <laughs> See, it's not where you're from, it's where you're going. It's not where you're from, it's where you're going. Jesus didn't find them there. Jesus found them somewhere else. It's never, listen, we got to stop letting people connect themselves to where they came from. We got to stop letting people connect themselves and find an excuse because that's where they were born or that's how they were raised. We are got to stop letting people connect themselves to something that keeps them in a place that is not going to bring them into the presence of God or bring them into the things that God has for them. Because we want to say that just because that's how my family was, that's how I am. The devil is a lie. I can't believe that I can break the whole of cancer on my family if I don't believe that I can break the, the whole of alcoholism on my family. It's not about any of that. Jesus wanted his disciples to understand that he came from a place where somebody, they said it couldn't nothing come good from Read the Bible. The Bible says, even some of those that ended up walking with him when they first met him, Philip and Nathaniel, first saw him and they says, well, nothing good comes from Nazareth. God will use whoever from wherever if you're willing to walk. And not just willing to walk, but if you're willing to walk away. And in 26, Jesus says, 
Then he sent the man away to his house saying, neither go into town nor tell anyone in town. Don't go into that place. There are gonna be times where you're not supposed to share what God is doing in your life with the wicked and the unbelieving. Wake up church. There are gonna be times in your life that you are not supposed to share what God is doing in your life with the wicked and the unbelieving. God showed me this and, and it, it was so profound when he showed it to me that there are times that if we're not careful, we want to share what God is doing in our life so people will look at us. Listen to what I'm saying to you now. This is how subtle that little bit of leaven called pride is in our life. We'll be talking about what God is doing in our life, but we're trying to impress somebody about how close we are to God. Maybe that message was just for me, but I got it. When he taught it to me yesterday, I got it. I got it. And you want to continue to wonder why devils seem to come in right after the blessing? It's not because devils can come in, because you offer them in, because Jesus didn't tell you to go tell the wicked and the ungodly what he had just done in your life, how he had just blessed you, how he had just delivered you, how he had just did a miracle in your life, something that you didn't deserve, something that didn't come out of your church going, something didn't come because you were good, and you're going to take it, glory to God, to the wicked and the ungodly and share it with them. There are times where you're not supposed to. There's a cost. And sometimes the cost is as simple as shut up. Keep your mouth shut. Give God the glory and keep it moving. I said, give God the glory and keep it moving. Give God the glory and keep it moving. There's a time for a testimony. There's a time to bear witness. But not all the time amongst the wicked. Not all the time amongst the ungodly and the unholy. We got to make sure that we're walking with God and according to his terms and according to his time. Amen. And even with the confession of, 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 of Peter, it says, when they had come, Christ and his disciples had come to Caesarea Philippi, not to be confused with Caesarea by the coast. He asked the disciples saying, who do men say I am? And this seems like a simple question until you study Caesarea Philippi. See, in a few years after Jesus had died, after this took place, the Greco-Roman idolaters took this same area and the cave that the water is coming out of that Jesus got them near and turned it over to Pan, their idol Pan in Greek mythology. But even in the days of Jesus, Jesus took them a place where there are carved inscriptions in the rocks. Come on, somebody. We think that they're sitting around the campfire. We think that this is happening right after the church service. Now, there are carved idols in the rocks. There's a demonic presence all around. Them. Come on. They're in the land of the Gentiles. They're in a land that's inhabited by, in, inhabited by Gentiles. And Jesus says, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? When you're sitting out there and don't nobody believe Jesus but you. Who do you say I am? When you get around certain friends, who do you say I am? When you're confronted with people and they, you're trying to blend in like some of these, these stickers that I see where they say coexist and they have all of these religious symbols coexisting and I cannot coexist. I can love all of you, but I can't coexist with you. I can't coexist with you because then I'm adding something to the loaf that'll make me sick. I'm adding something to my loaf. I'm adding something to my loaf that ain't good for me, amen? I can love you with the love of Jesus, but we can't coexist in the way that you want to coexist. I can't blend Jesus in with other things because Jesus is not a religion. Jesus is the way of life. Jesus is the last voice that's going to come from heaven. Jesus is the last opportunity that man is going to have. There is no plan B. There is no wait for another Messiah. There is no wait. There's nothing coming after him except the judgment. Amen. My God, my God. My God, my God. Yeah. 
Who, who do you say I am? Ask yourself sometime. When you're in certain situations, who, who am I to you right now? Who am I to you right now? With the people that are around you, with the idolatry that's around you, with the language that's around you, with the fumes that's around you, everything going around you, who am I to you? Don't be asking them who, they, who I am to them. I want to know who I am to you. See, sometimes in the church, we want to find out, are you believing in the Lord? What do you think about Jesus? No, who am I to you? Your confession is your co covenant acknowledgement. Your con the confession is your consensual agreement. Jesus is saying, who am I to you? Oh, my God. Ah. Jesus is trying to get the disciples to commit. He's trying to get them to commit. And Peter said that you are the Christ. I found it different in Mark that Matthew says that uh, Jesus responded, um, flesh and blood didn't give you this answer. This came from revelation of God. That's in Matthew, but not in Mark. And knowing from history and theology that Peter fed Mark. Mark got his information from Peter. It's just like walking on water. It's not recorded in Mark because Peter didn't want it in Mark. Peter, when he was giving the details of the gospel to Mark, he never raised himself up beyond anything other than a servant. He points out his mistakes. Come on, listen to what I'm saying because we give Peter a hard time. Peter points out his mistakes. Mark would have given him a platform to really boast of himself, but Peter plays himself down as less than most all the other disciples. This is something that we need to learn. In, in, in Bible study, we are learning that Peter was not as ignorant and the disciples were not as ignorant as scriptures as we think they are. In the Acts of the Apostles, Peter began to, to quote some, some, some Psalms, Psalm 68 and 103, Psalms that we don't even read. Let's just be real with it. We read those Psalms about as often as we read Leviticus. Come on now. You know about much about those Psalms as you do if I tell you to turn to Nahum right now. You go, what, who? Is that a real book? <laughs> but Peter had knowledge that we didn't give him credit for the disciples had knowledge that we didn't give him credit for but Jesus was trying to get him to a place but then listen just like he told the man don't tell anyone he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him wow back to back I thought you were trying to grow this ministry you had 5,000, and that's just counting men, not counting the women and children. You go to Samaria, and you have a woman to take the word into the Decapolis, which is 10 cities. I thought we spread in this thing, Lord. God wants us to understand that there is still a responsibility to, to the spreading, because there are times when sharing the revelation that God has given us and the true knowledge of God needs to be withheld because we need to understand that it's not agreeable with everybody that we're trying to share it with. See, everybody is not desiring the same Jesus that you're desiring. There are still some milk babies that don't want to eat that solid meat. Ain't nobody trying to chew on no meat of the word. I came to church because they told me that I could get a car. They told me I could find a wife or a husband. They told me God would bless me. I'd get a better job. I'm believing in some money. I'm believing that I'll be healed. I still eat nothing. I eat wrong. I don't exercise. I don't care about nothing. Smoke three packs of cigarettes a day. But I'm believing on healing. As I eat a whole cheesecake. <laughs> God don't deliver me from my clog arteries. Yeah. Everybody doesn't want to hear what you got to say. Jesus says, don't tell them who I am. They're going to have to find out another way. They're going to have to find out another way. Israel didn't want to be delivered from sin and Satan. They wanted to be delivered from Rome. Woo! 
There's some people out here that ain't wanting to be delivered from sin and Satan. They want to be delivered from poverty. They want to be delivered from loneliness. They want to be delivered from whatever it is in their life right now, whatever it is that's oppressing them. They are not intent on being delivered from sin and Satan. Let the church say, this is tough. We're going to tear down some strongholds. See, Jesus ain't going to pull them by the hand, but we can. Jesus won't drag them, but we can. I'll drag them all the way to the foot of the cross if the Lord let me. Amen. My God, my God. My God, my God. But this is what the Lord was trying to get and to pull into them. But he began, began to tell them the things that he had to suffer and the things. He was pouring out revelation now. He's telling them, don't tell them about me. But now he begins to pour out revelation to those that are closest to him. He's pouring out the revelation of those that are, to those that are closest to him. And it says that Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. See, sometimes we think that, that this means that there was a, a demonic oppression in Peter. No, it was not. Peter was speaking out of his fear. Peter was speaking out of his flesh. Peter was speaking out of what he thought it should look like. Listen to what I'm saying. I just told him, we got to bring our thoughts up to try to meet the thoughts of Jesus. We got to bring our thoughts up. We can't just be so reactive to what we read that it goes to who we are normally. Come on now. We can't go back into where we are normally and who we are normally and react like that. We have to come up and try to meet Jesus where he is. Come on, somebody. Peter was not under any type of demonic oppression. Peter what, what, what was not, uh, uh, didn't need to have an a demon exercised out of him. Peter was speaking through his fear. Peter was speaking through his flesh. Peter was saying that what humanly felt right, but he didn't understand the cause of God. We, God wants us to get to a place that even in our normal life, we are, we are still compelled to seek the spirit even in our normal life before we react. Oh, my God, my God. He, God wants us to look, listen to what I'm saying to you. If we can try to meet Jesus in our mind, then the impulses we have will not be of our flesh, they'll be of our spirit. And our spirit is connected to God. It is our spirit that's born again, not of our flesh, not of our mind, not of our soul. It is our spirit. And this will control our impulses so our impulses will look like Jesus instead of me looking like he. This is what God wants us to do. This is what the scripture means. Peter was acting on, listen to what I'm saying to you. And I want you to get this, get this deep down in you. Peter was acting on suggestion. Something was suggested into his mind. He says, no, this can't happen. The devil makes suggestions to you all day long that sound good. The devil makes suggestions to you all day long that sound right. But if we don't understand the plan of God and not seeking the plan of God, and if we think we're going to find out the plan of God and be gratified in five minutes or five seconds or read eight scriptures or read a chapter a day, and all of a sudden now I understand what God wants from me. How about just reading a few verses and praying over? Lord, reveal this word to me. Reveal it to me, God. Reveal it to me. Show me, Lord God. Not just for myself, but how I can help somebody else. How I can bless somebody else. How I can enlighten somebody else by the power of your word. My God, my God. I want to turn it over to Luke now because it's the same in the Synoptic Gospels. I, I like the way Luke worded what would be 34. 
in Mark is Luke 9 and 23. Then Jesus said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That's one of the things that I got from Luke. Luke says daily. Luke says daily. Luke said that you can't do it one time. I got to take up my cross daily. Daily, I have to walk fully exposed to whatever suffering I, I might have to face to hold on to my confession of Jesus. Daily, I have to open, be open to the ridicule that I might have to face and pay that cost for my confession and my agreement with Jesus being my Lord and Savior. I got to pick up this cross daily and face embarrassment if need be. Be stripped down, lose friends, have people run away from me that I thought would never leave my side. I got to be able to stand in that for the confession of Christ Jesus. I got to be willing to pay that cost and pick up that cross daily. Daily. It might not happen on Sunday and Monday and Tuesday. And sometimes it happens at a most opportune time because I'm around people that I thought I could trust and people that would be on my side about things. But all of a sudden something breaks out and there's a spirit unlike the spirit that's dwelling inside of me. And I have to stand there and take it. I have to stand there and keep my mouth shut. I can't react. I can't go with my impulse because the mind of Christ is saying, stand there and pray for them as they talk about you, as they call you stupid, as they calling your names, as they telling you how dumb you are. Go head on. Now they talking about all of this stuff. Go head on and ask God to forgive them and show them the light. Amen? That's a part of our confession. That's a part of the call. Pick up that cross. Pick it up daily. Lord have mercy. We're getting to the end, y'all. Don't fall out on me. He said, listen, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. He's not talking about you dying in the natural. That's the difference in dieting and fasting. Fasting is not a diet. Fasting is denying my flesh. Hey. You lose five pounds, how much you've been fasting. No, you gained it right back. You ain't done no good. God is trying to get us to understand this. If you invest only in earthly resources, you will have no eternal reward. That's the hard, cold facts of it. That's the hard code. Another reason that I, I, I chose Luke to close it, he says, what is the profit of man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? I know uh, Mark and Matthew say it different. Uh, if he uh, lose his own soul, what would a man exchange for his soul? I understand that. I understand that this is why you look at all the synoptic gospels. Don't be lazy. Read them all. But I like what Luke says here. For whosoever is ashamed of me not just me, but my words. You can't reinterpret my words to fit your friend. And you can't, re you can't reinvent my words for the Muslims or the LGBTQ community. He says, it's not because you don't believe. Listen to what I'm saying now. He's not talking to the unbeliever. He says, you are ashamed of me and ashamed of my words. It's not that you don't believe. You were ashamed of me and what I say. He says, okay. Y'all, son of man, I'm going to be ashamed when I come into my own. When I come into my glory, 
You're going to be one of those that I say, I don't know you. Because you were ashamed not only of me, but you were ashamed of what I said. You were ashamed of my truth. You tried to change my word, but I said that if anybody changes one syllable, one tittle of my word, going to hell. I told you don't do it. But you were so ashamed, you were so interested in pleasing the people around you that you didn't understand that there were consequences. He says, I didn't tell you to make your confession. You confessed me. Jesus didn't make me confess him. I confessed him. There is not a saved person that's saved today that God made them. God allowed them and drew them near and gave them opportunity. He gave us opportunity. You confessed me and now all of a sudden you get around a certain group of people because you want this job. You want to fit in in this group of people. And all of a sudden now people can make Bible jokes and talk about certain things and you're ashamed of me. He said, not only am I going to be ashamed of you, he said, but so is my father and his holy angel. That pretty much seals the fate right there. This whole thing is extremely important in the Christian life. This confession and the cost of our confession is important. I don't know how long you've been saved, but being saved hadn't cost you some friendships. Don't worry, it's coming. If it hadn't cost you what used to be opportunities, it's coming. Let me go deep on somebody. If your relationship in Christ Jesus over the years, I'm not talking about in the last two, three years, but at some point in time, didn't make you feel bad about denying your flesh. Because your flesh was wrestling with your spirit. And you were so used to those years without Christ giving in to your flesh that you had to have a fight within yourself. You had to pay that cost within yourself. Whether it was a lie, whether it was gossip, whether it was money, whether it was sex, whether it was a drink, whatever it was, an evil thought, doing somebody wrong, cheating somebody, whatever it was, you had to suck it up and couldn't let it come out. That's the cause. That's the cause. It's eternal. Paul said it's a faith fight. It's a faith fight. But God will lay hold on us. And we can lay hold on eternal life. But you got to pay the cost, Paul said. And confess a good confession. Paul said you got to confess a good confession. Because my Lord Jesus on this communion Sunday was beaten and bloodied, the word of God said. He was beaten and he was stripped back. He was mistreated and mishandled and misused snatched the hair out of his beard, crown of thorns on his head, knowing that he was going to die by crucifixion, humiliated in every way possible, glory to God. But the Bible says that he had a good confession before Pontius Pilate. Knowing what he was facing, he still had a good confession. He had, he had to acknowledge his covenant with the Father. He had acknowledged his covenant with the Father. You understand what I'm saying to you? That what I'm facing right now is not going to even begin to compare with the glory that I'm getting ready to receive. What I'm dealing with right now is only going to be temporary, but what God is getting ready to drop on me is going to start now and it's going to continue forever and ever. Amen? Amen? This is a consensual agreement that I said I wanted to be a part of and God let me in. So ain't no sense in tucking tail when things get hard. Because God wants me to know that he will bless me and he will heal me. But I got to go through this to get to that. I got to show up, glory to God, so he can show out. Because I am his ambassador. I am his mouthpiece. I am his feet. I am his hand. I have the mind of Christ. I got to pray for my enemy. I got to be good to those that despitefully use me. I got to do those things that don't make no sense. So somebody can see Jesus, amen. Amen. 
I want everybody that's unsaved right now. I'm going to read you something. It's in Romans 10. Let me show you what God has done. In Romans 10, beginning at verse 9, for anybody that, that's either unsaved or unsure, listen to all y'all unsure people that ain't sure. God is going to show you how to make it sure. He says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's not where you are. Listen, you're watching it on YouTube. Listen, I will not be the first person that the Holy Ghost showed up in when they were high. He showed up many, many years ago with me. And everything that was in my system was washed out by his presence. By his presence. He says, listen, oh, I, I, I'm not making you jump through hoops. He said, confess me with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. You will have eternal life. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. If you can get your heart from fighting against God, from trying to be a part of something that has rejected you over and over, this world don't really like you. They just want what you got. They want the gifts that they see inside of you. He says, if you can believe in your heart, let me tell you something. People think that righteousness is something that, that you have to work for. He says, uh-uh, you believe in your heart? Right now, you are in right standing with God. Whoever you are, whoever you are, wherever you are, if you can open up your heart and quit pushing back against God and believe in your heart right now, come on, whoever you are, God says, I'll place you, that right there places you in right standing with me. It's not about time, sir. It's about your heart. It's about your heart. Your confession is made unto your salvation. See, somebody told you, you got to get rid of that, and you got to get rid of him, and you got to get rid of her, and you got to stop this. No, no, the word of God says, confession is made. Until your salvation, the free pardon of your sins for all eternity can come out of your mouth if your heart is connected to it. It will reach God's heart in heaven because Jesus has already applied the blood to the mercy seat for you. It's waiting for you. If you ain't unsure, don't keep on walking around talking about I don't know because you don't know if you got another breath in your body. Those of you who are saved, before I turn it over for communion, I want to remind you what Hebrew tells us. You got to remember that you got a great high priest. He ain't no bone. He ain't no little skinny guy. Pitiful looking thing. Hanging on a piece of wood. He is the Lion of Judah. He is the mighty God. So you got to understand that seeing that you have a great high priest who has already passed through the heaven. He is Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. Hold on to your acknowledgement of who God is. Hold on to your consensual agreement. It's between you and God. It ain't between you and nobody else. Don't let nobody tell you that your agreement ain't good as theirs. Your agreement is good enough for God's glory to rain down in your life. Because you have a great high priest. Amen? Oh, my God. And he ain't like some preacher who denies that he's ever been tempted. This high priest we got can sympathize with every weakness inside of us because in every point he was tempted just as we are. But he is the role model because he didn't sin. He didn't sin. He came to save us from our sin. Oh my God, my God. He experienced I've heard some people say, well, he might not have experienced this and he didn't experience that. Jesus experienced every degree 
of temptation that man can know. Every degree of temptation than man that man can know. And he didn't see. He is ours. You got to remind yourself sometimes when you feel like your Christian walk is getting weak. You feel like you've stumbled and you failed. You feel like the things ain't working out for you. The word of God says that let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. I said come boldly to the throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy and find grace in our time of need. Come because the veil has been rent. You don't need somebody to come in between you. You can go directly to God all by yourself. Come boldly. I want to tell somebody today that might have made some mistakes and sinned and did something and made a bad decision. He says, you come on boldly because you're still my child. You come on boldly because you still belong to me. You come on boldly just like you came in the house after curfew. You know it was still your house. You know it was still your house. You know you broke mom and daddy rules, but you came in because it was still your house. It was still a place of comfort. It was still a place of shelter. It was still a place to be fed. It was still a place to be protected. He says, I've got a house because now you are the household of Christ. You come on in here. You come on in here, even if you did mess up, because I'll still feed you. I'll still protect you. I'll still love you. I'll still deliver you. I'll still bless you. I'll still keep you because you belong to me. Amen? Amen? Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Give him some praise in this house. 